Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, my name is Christopher Mickeljohn. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this work that I do on this programming language that's part of my PhD research called LASP. Uh, and uh, this language is designed for large-scale computing uh, that's not necessarily high throughput, but uh, operates while clients are offline. You have a lot of divergence you need to deal with uh, resolving concurrent updates. And so I'm super excited. So if you've, you've seen my talks before, which you probably have, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro. It's always the same, so I apologize for those that are repeat, repeat uh, attendees to my talks. Um, but then we'll have a bunch of new stuff at the end that talks about uh, experiments that we did with distributed rolling. Now, I will just say I'm super excited to be here. Uh, is Costas in this room? No. Um, well, uh, at EUC two years ago, I presented the first version of this work, which was based on a paper I had at the Erlang workshop. And man, he gave me a lot of heat. So I'm proud to be back, because uh, our system runs a lot better than it did then. Uh, it ran at five nodes with React Core then. And so we've done a lot to change that. And so super excited. OK, so we'll get right into it. So uh, I'm going to do an overview of the language before I start talking about the things that we did around uh, scaling a runtime system to a large number of clients. So, uh, you know, in a distributed system, sometimes you have two replicas of an object. We'll say this is a register. And uh, the way it works is that with a register, you can set a, a value or you can get the current value. And so if I set the value to 1 on replica A, and then I asynchronously send a message to say, here's the value of replica 1, and I do this without any coordination, uh, when I then go to perform two updates that happen concurrently, uh, setting the value to 2 and 3 respectively without coordination, I end up with this problem. And this problem is, is that when I am writing this program ahead of time, I don't know what the result of this is going to be. It could be anything. The scheduler could give me any number of arbitrary interleavings of these messages, and these things could be delayed, reordered, whatever. And I don't know what the value is going to be. And so this makes programming difficult. And Traditionally, the way we solve this, if, you know, if, you, if you're a concurrent programmer or, or a distributed systems programmer, traditionally, we, we use synchronization to solve this. So we get everybody to agree on an order that these events are going to be observed in. And having this order allows us to eliminate accidental non-determinism in the system. So you may, more, you, know, you may know this as its more common name as race conditions is one example, right? And so you, you might have these different interleavings of the scheduler, and sometimes you get two, sometimes you get three, you don't know. So what do you do? Well, normally, you'll just like wrap this thing up with a lock, or uh, you can use a monitor, which is kind of like the synchronized keyword in Java, or you use a mutex or a semaphore or whatever. If you're running this in a distributed computing environment, maybe use the Paxos leader election algorithm, maybe use Raft, whatever. The idea is that you want to have something that's going to enforce this total order of events so you can reason about how to write code. Right? And so on a sequential processor with sequential execution with single thread, we don't have to think about this. And so where my work comes in is that uh, I'm trying to solve large-scale programming for mobile apps that go offline. Uh, we worked with Rovio Entertainment. Uh, we're, we're talking to some new game companies now. And uh, we, with Internet of Things, if, you're happy, if you happen to use shared data. So we have some examples of this as well. And so the problem here is that you can't use an approach like Paxos if you have clients that need to operate when they're offline. Uh, you can't get consensus on, you know, get a leader and then have that leader sequence all the operations if you can't talk to the leader. And so these domains, it's really difficult. And so what we want to do is we want to try to design systems that have weak synchronization or very little synchronization required to achieve correctness, right? But we can't really build anything if we have no synchronization, right? Uh, and so we can think of like a map reduce job where we don't do any reduce, we only do a map. Well, sure, that's embarrassingly parallel. We don't need synchronization for that, right? Except maybe to get some a priori cluster configuration. And so the, the kind of sweet spot we're trying to hit is uh, this thing that's referred to in the literature as strong eventual consistency. And uh, what this is is a correctness criteria that says, uh, regardless of ordering, it's eventually consistent. There's no order get ordering guarantees at all. Uh, as long as I observe all the updates in the system, and you know, all the replicas observe all the updates in the system, you'll get the same result, regardless of reordering, regardless of replay, regardless of network anomalies. And so um, the only requirement you have to build a system with SEC is that you have uh, replica to replica communication. So transitively, you have to deliver all the updates to everybody. Um, and what's great about this property is that it's, it can tolerate reordering of messages, um, which is a reality we have to deal with on unreliable networks. And it can tolerate duplication of messages which is nice if you have to replay events because you don't know if you delivered something. 
And so uh, to give you a trivial example of how we could fulfill this property, uh, if we go back to our pr uh, the, the previous example, uh, we can trivially fulfill this property uh, if we're dealing with just natural numbers by using the max function. And kind of the mathematical properties that allow this to happen is that max is monotonic, and you kind of, over these naturals, you can form a semi-lattice, and because of all this great math and all this stuff that you shouldn't have to know about as a programmer, regardless of how I reorder any of the arrows in this execution, I will get the same result, regardless. And so, uh, you know, we don't have to go into the details of all that stuff. You shouldn't have to know how any of that works as a programmer. That's, that's our job as researchers, to build abstractions around this stuff, uh, so you can just get the benefits of it. And so if we were to define a criteria on how we could use strong eventual consistency to build a certain class of systems, systems that need to operate while offline, systems that need to tolerate these unreliable networks, then we could define it in three sections. And so the first one we could say is that, well, we need data structures that can be concurrently modified without locking that will get the same result. And so that's kind of the first component, is eliminating accidental non-determinism on the data structure level. Uh, the second thing is that we'd like to have a programming language where we can transparently distribute these data structures, and regardless of the interleavings, the program will have the same output if it runs on one machine or 10 machines. Right? And so we want to build a language. Now, this language can't be as expressive as a language like C, for instance, because there's a bunch of things you can't do safely without coordination. And so what we're trying to do is build a minimal subset language where you can express only computations that are safe. They are transparently able to be distributed, and they produce the same results regardless. And finally, uh, you'd imagine that you know, to do, to gain these nice properties, we have to make a trade-off here. That trade-off's usually in time and space. And so one of the challenges we have to deal with is how do we efficiently distribute this data across the network? And most of the rest of the talk, once I get through the basic primer on one and two, is going to be focused around how we do number three. <clears throat> And so, though, you know, CRDTs, you've probably heard it. It's been at this conference a lot uh, already. And so uh, CRDTs are kind of the base work, the previous work that we build upon. And uh, what CRDTs are, they're just a subset of, you know, they're, they're abstract data structures. They're abstract data types that have an API that's similar to, uh, you know, a sequential data type. They come in all these varieties. Um, but there are certain things that you can't model with CRDTs. So the, the scope is kind of limited, and the ones that our work focuses around are mainly sets, counters, uh, registers, flags, and maps, and, and sometimes graphs. <laughs> and uh, what these objects give you is a, it, they, they fulfill the strong eventual consistency property. They fulfill this convergence property on an object basis. So individual objects, no composition, individual objects that are modified independently. And to kind of give you an intuition of how this works, so I'm going to show you a very uh, inefficient CRDT, but it's good for demonstration. If I needed to model a set where I could add things and remove things in a way that it was always safe under any arbitrary interleaving, what I need to do is I need to model the set as a series of triples represented here in the bottom section, where I have the element that's been added to the set and some unique identifiers that represent every time it's been added and every time it's been removed. And so what I do is, uh, I can make this modification at A, I generate this little unique little A, and I can send the message, and that says, well, A added one to the set with unique constant A. I'm using A here for simplicity. Now, when C goes to add, uh, when C goes to add one to the set here, it generates a different identifier. And then if C goes to remove before it's seen A's additions, then C can only remove the additions it's seen. And so C can only remove its own addition because those messages from A haven't arrived yet. They arrive in the future. And so this allows us to build a CRDT that allows us to add and remove elements. We have this nice arbitration on winning and uh, win, uh, towards winning under concurrent additions. And when we merge all of this together by performing pairwise set unions, at the end, we see that, well, one is still in the set because it was added and removed by C, but it was also concurrently added by A, and C was never able to remove uh, A's addition. And so this gives us this property on a per-object basis. And so you can imagine that we model counters this way, we can model sets this way, we can model uh, flags this way, flags are booleans, um, and we can model all sorts of things this way. So now the challenge here is that once I have these set representations that are both expensive and have all of this metadata, uh, I can't just read the value of it and then change some other CRDT, because now I've lost this causal relationship knowing that these updates cause this other update. And so to solve this, what we do is we try to build a system that provides a programming abstraction around this. So you program just like you're programming in Haskell or you're programming in Erlang or whatever. Um, and we transparently do all of these behind the scenes metadata things. So you can think of this as monadic in a way, right? And so 
Uh, the language that we have is a uh, minimal language just on sets right now. Uh, it's called LASP. Um, it's a kind of a functional programming model that's implemented as a library in Erlang. And you can think of it as a language where the only data structures you have to work with are CRDTs. And so we have this safe base that we build upon. We have this language that only allows us to work with CRDTs. And then everything is really nice and safe. And so this allows us to write entire computer programs that they can't do everything. You know, that, that like you could in Erlang. But the things that they can do, they can do 100% safe. And so, uh, you know, the DSL we have in Erlang looks roughly like this. Um, we can create a set. We can add elements to the set. And we can create another set. And then we can map between the sets or something. And so you have operations like map and filter and fold and product union intersection. And so it's expressive enough that we can provide a minimal subset of SQL so you can actually write programs in SQL today. In it. <clears throat> and so finally, we have to think about, so now we've seen we have this programming model. It's really safe because it doesn't do a ton, but it does you know, enough to express some class of programs. Now we have data structures that are really safe, but they're expensive because they store a bunch of metadata. And so we need an efficient runtime system for disseminating all this data. And so the runtime system that we have here is called, uh, is this uh, work in progress. Uh, this, is, this system's called selective hearing. And kind of the observation here says, well, if I don't need to order all of the events, I can use very efficient ways of disseminating state. I can use gossip protocols. I can flood the network. I can build optimized broadcast trees. If I don't need ordering, I can do things in a much more efficient way than if I needed to deliver all of the events in order and make sure everybody sees them in the same order at the same time. And so by weakening that, we can take advantage of pro protocols that have been used for like video dissemination in networks, like protocols like Thicket for disseminating video between peers in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. We can take advantage of all these protocols that are optimized for very fast dissemination. And so this is a really nice, you know, you can kind of see the benefit here. This is really nice. It pairs very well because we have a programming model that's safe and it doesn't require ordering. And so we can use a, a, a language. And so we can use a protocol where we don't have ordering to get very efficient dissemination. Now, that's not the only trick here, though, because if you're trying to build a runtime system for 20,000 nodes, or 10,000 nodes is a target number. That's our ambitious target number. We're not there yet. We're not even close yet, but we're getting there. Uh, you can't have you cannot target other processes by name. You can't have a global registry. You, sure, you can. You can build a global registry with a DHT. That's totally possible. But is that the programming model you want, where you have to identify people by name and say, here's a message I'm trying to send to you? And so what we're trying to do is look at this in a different way, where maybe it's better to build a model where it's kind of a publish-subscribe thing. I have some information about a computer program that's running. And you may have a, if, if, uh, another computer program running. And you care about some information in common. And so maybe we can use a pub subsystem to broadcast this. Maybe we can do this very efficiently if we don't have to have ordering. And so what we're trying to do with this is, is build a framework that we can explore alternative ways of building systems where they're safe and they can be highly efficient. Now, to give you an idea of how uh, we structure this uh, in terms of our, our Erlang code, or our prototype, uh, the way LASP works uh, and the way the runtime executes today is it's composed of, uh, the runtime system's composed of three, three, kind of, uh, three separate components here. Uh, the first is a membership component. And so this says, while a distributed application is running, I need to know all of the members in the cluster that are running this program right now. And so the membership protocol, the membership layer of our system, is used to track this information and maintain it. Now, once we have this membership overlay, this forms a structured overlay network. Once we have this overlay, we can optimize that overlay by building broadcast trees through it, like computing a spanning tree. We can do all sorts of optimizations. And those optimizations should be configurable based on if your network can support it, right? Because we are targeting mobile, so we're targeting systems that have high churn. You don't know who's going to be in the cluster from one moment to the next. You need to support all of these things. And so finally, once we have all the nodes in the cluster and we have a way to uh, optimize this, this network that we've built of nodes, we need a way to automatically discover new nodes as they come on the network, right? And so this is kind of what facilities like EPMD do for us. And so uh, most of our experiments are run in Mesos. Most of all of our work is done in Mesos because we find Mesos pretty easy to work with for the most part. And uh, so we've built an auto discovery system based on Mesos. But you know, depending on the, the, the uh, domain you're in, you may have to use a different component here. And so to give you a diagram of what this looks like, it looks roughly like this. We have our membership overlay and our broadcast overlay, which is optional. And we build this network. This network has a series of nodes. And let's say the dotted lines represent you know, the overlay network, and then the solid lines represent an optimization we found, so a path through the network that allows us to deliver the messages to all the nodes efficiently. 
Now, we have a logical abstraction here that says, well, the last system is going to treat a mobile phone the same way as a DHT. And so this allows us to have a unified programming interface and defer the, defer the responsibilities of durability, persistence, and replication to the underlying layer. We say, yes, you may have a DHT, it may be 40 nodes, but we're going to treat those as one logical node in the system to give us a unified view from the programming level. Um, so we don't treat these nodes differently. And then we slide in a little programming layer there that we work with. And so this is how we can, uh, this is kind of the basis of how we have begun thinking about uh, a highly scalable runtime. So I'm going to give you a, an example application that we've been working with uh, before I talk about uh, our evaluation at scale. And so uh, we have this thing, this ad counter, you've probably seen me present it, I've done it for about two years. And the idea here is that we want to have a mobile game that's going to display ads while it's offline. And uh, these advertisements are going to be counters that track the number of times they've been shown. And uh, the criteria here is the system has to be 100% available. It has to operate while clients are offline or partitioned. But we can never lose an ad. And so we have to keep track of those increments that are done and then periodically synchronize it back. Now, occasionally, the server is going to say, this ad shouldn't be displayed anymore, and it's going to send that information down to the client. And so the model that we're thinking about here is that the server has some state, the mobile devices are going to cache that state, operate on it locally, and then come back online and synchronize that back with the server. Now, that's challenging because with shared state, there's going to be conflicts, and we need to solve these. And this is what the CRDT property gives us. And so the application looks roughly like this. You can express this whole thing in SQL. Um, and it basically just says we have a bunch of ads, and we, you know, we interjoin them with uh, contracts to know which ads we can display. But the most important part is that the ads get copied down to the client during some exchange while the client's online. And periodically, those clients, will, while they're online, will synchronize back with the centralized server to say, here's the current counts. The advertisement server will keep track of this, and then it will say, stop displaying that ad. It's been displayed too many times. And so this is the workflow. And so it's very similar to a web program where you know, your browser might cache some object for a little bit, and you operate on it locally and send it back. This model is very familiar. <clears throat> and so this is the application that we're going to use uh, to talk about uh, the work that we've done on trying to get the system, to get the system uh, robust. And so uh, I'm going to talk about an initial evaluation that we first performed with this system uh, in February of uh, 2016. We did this for a conference, uh, workshop submission to uh, a workshop at Eurosys, and we're rejected, and rightly so. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to talk about what, what happened, OK? And so uh, I don't know everybody's background in the room, so we'll do a quick little background on, on distributed Erlang. And so uh, distributed Erlang is a transparent distribution facility. Uh, this allows you to spawn processes on other nodes. It allows you to kind of work with these processes, uh, send them messages on other nodes, and all sorts of things like this. So it's kind of transparent distribution for actors. Um, and there are some known scalability limitations that have been documented at various academic venues. Um, but it's unclear where those limitations actually lie. So we knew that we were getting into a situation. We knew that we were getting into trouble initially. Um, and even if you haven't looked at any of this academic literature or attended any of the EUCs where it's been discussed, there's kind of two core problems that should be fairly straightforward to reason about. And so the first one is that uh, with single connections between nodes, which is the default, uh, you clearly can run into head-of-line blocking problems. Uh, this was a problem when I worked at Basho Technologies on React. Uh, this is a very big problem. If you have large objects, you can back up transfer between a bunch of processes talking on the, between the same nodes. Now, the second problem is full membership, which if you're not familiar with the academic work in the area, you may think of less, uh, as uh, less of a problem, right, or not realize this is a problem. So full membership is problematic because full membership means that every node knows about every other node in the cluster and will potentially heartbeat this, right? And so we've known that this is a scalability problem, at least in the academic sense, for years. And uh, there's a ton of work in this. Um, basically, the solution is you take two approaches. You have every node only know about a subset. Or if you want to maintain full membership, which is actually the easiest one to reason about from a debugging a real system point of view, uh, you have to find a way to do more accurate failure detection. And so uh, if you're familiar with the console system, uh, console uses the SWIM protocol. And so the SWIM protocol says, well, I want to know about everybody. Uh, I don't want to deal with partial views, because partial views are difficult. And so what SWIM proposes is an alternative heartbeat strategy. And so the challenge here is that, sure, I can have full membership, and I can have 2,000 nodes. But how fast can you heartbeat 2,000 nodes? And so the longer that interval takes, the, more, the less efficient your application will be, because it will be spending so much time sending to nodes that are down. 
Now, uh, the second component of distributed Erlang that you're probably familiar with is the Erlang port mapper daemon. If you don't know what this is, it's kind of like an uh, old school RPC style port mapper. Uh, it's, it's basically, I run on a known port, so I can, do dynamic, uh, I can map to services that have dynamic port configuration. Um, this is a problem if you want to run things virtualized with bridge networking, because you can't always use the same port. And so you need to dynamically allocate ports. You need to have a way to discover those randomly allocated ports. And so we knew that this was going to be a problem as well uh, when running experiments. So when, when I say experiment, what do I mean? Well, I mean that I want to take that advertisement counter as one example, and I want to configure this, and I want to run it in a bunch of different scenarios with different numbers of clients, with different synchronization intervals, with different types of CRDTs. And I want all of this information to be configurable at runtime. And so our system has there, literally every option that you could configure is configurable. We have uh, environment launching scripts that will have 100 variables that get configured. Everything is configured, and we make it somewhat efficient by an extreme, extremely heavy use of Mochi Global, <laughs> um, for those of you who know Mochi Global. Uh, membership for our initial experiments were done uh, using regular distributed Erlang with EPMD. And for state dissemination, we just had nodes periodically exchange state with each other based on some interval that we configured. Now, to orchestrate the experiment, we wrapped all of our code in Mesos and Docker. So we have Docker images that have EP we have a standalone EPMD Docker image. We have a LASP Docker image. We put all of these things in Marathon. We ran all of this on Mesos. We ran all of this in AWS. Um, to ensure we only ran one EPMD per node, we placed a hostname unique constraint on the Mesos slave. Uh, and um, this allowed us to only launch one EPMD and make it a, a requirement of the last container to run. And so there was this kind of dependency that prevented one from starting before the other. Uh, LASP connected to the local EPMDs, and the local EPMDs got clustered through this uh, service discovery thing we made called Sprinter. So that was just how nodes could find each other in this Mesos cluster, because you, know, you get dynamic IPs and dynamic ports. And so what we thought would be an ideal experiment, this is what the academics want, <laughs> what we thought would be an ideal experiment, what we thought we'd be able to achieve, is that I wanted the ability to run a four-node Mesos cluster on my machine with my Erlang app running with distributed Erlang, and I wanted to simulate a higher load count by having threads do the work. And then what I wanted to do was when I moved to the cloud, I wanted to lower the thread concurrency and increase the node count. So I could design one piece of code and just toggle some switches when I went from my computer, this little crappy MacBook that has no RAM and no hard drive space, to running an AWS where I have plentiful resources that I can buy with the oh so much money we have as academics. And uh, what we quickly learned is that uh, this, this does not work at all. <laughs> it does not work at all. And so. Um, one was that uh, the transferring between the AWS environment and running locally uh, required so much custom configuration to adapt the environments that it slowly became a burden and we just said, screw it, we'll run an AWS exclusively, nobody can work offline. Which is unfortunate for grad students with limited money. The other thing that we ran into was that if you are running a test with five Erlang virtual machines or 10 Erlang virtual machines, you can have a single test runner orchestrate that whole test. It can wait for all the events to be sent. It can, you know, it can wait for the events to be delivered. It can wait for the events to be processed and then shut the test down and generate some graph. Uh, we quickly found out that this obviously doesn't work <laughs> at all. Uh, and so uh, this is a bottleneck um, because events just got immediately dispatched to the mailbox and then they would be processed all at once. That's not a realistic workload. That's not how systems in the real world work. Uh, the, second the second problem was this is unrealistic. This is completely unrealistic, right? Um, in so many ways, this is unrealistic. If, if you think about Amdahl's law, if you're trying to test a 500 node cluster and you have a single machine orchestrating the test, you're not going to run any faster than that single machine. And so why even test at 500 nodes? And so we thought we had, we had to step back and completely change our approach to testing. Um, in terms of LASP, too expensive. Uh, too much CPU is required. Two gigs of memory is required. We spent weeks remotely debugging in Amazon with Observer, with logging, uh, logging literally everything, process mailbox sizes, most expensive processes, everything. Um, we also found that this thread concurrency to uh, node ratio was wrong. Um, uh, 100 threads will contend for shared resources like you know the network. <laughs> and so uh, basically, 
it meant that when we were testing locally, we were testing a completely different thing than when we were testing on Amazon because this thread concurrency thing is not, it's not a right mapping. And uh, what we would find is that evaluations locally would show these like results that were like, oh my god, that's so impressive. And then we'd run an Amazon and we would see like results that were like, well, we processed, I forget what it was. At one point we were processing like two messages a second or something because of some network delay with some sort of other thing that was racing for some driver or something. And it was abysmal. And so, yeah, it doesn't work. Um, EPMD, another problem. Uh, EPMD would go down. Another container would race to start it up. That task would get restarted because it ran out of memory, because the mailbox got too big, because it wasn't processing messages fast enough. That would crash. EPMD would start in another container. Um, just these, these like, cascading failures across containers, because you just have queues upon queues that just back up, crash nodes, the nodes come up, they race to start, they get a different IP, then they join the cluster, then you deliver all these messages, you overload a queue. So it was a nightmare. And, um, and uh, you know, also, um killer. Mesos will just kill these things if you violate the C groups with the, the um killer. And then, you know, how do you debug that? So it's like a node goes away. It was running slow. Why was it running slow? I don't know, because there's no logs, because the um killer killed the container. And so after we got everything working, what did we discover? Well, we discovered that uh, in 90 seconds, we would ship five gigs of state for, uh, for a cluster of five nodes. Now, if you're building a mobile centered uh, programming language, you can't send five gigs worth of data in 90 seconds to each device. Not happening. Um, even when we applied incremental optimizations, which uh, involve buffering updates for known devices based on what they've seen, we got a 30% reduction. Doesn't work. Uh, and finally, unbounded queues are, an, are the bane of debugging. It is unbelievable. They are, it's, it's terrible. And so what we decided, well, we got to re-architect everything. And so uh, this is work that's still going on to this day. So we've been working on this since February. Uh, we burn about $1,000 to $2,000 on Amazon a month, even though we have optimized the experiment so much that you can run one command. You can run one command and fall asleep and wake up, and it will run all the experiments and auto shut down the cluster, everything. We have automated all of this. You can, build a you can deploy an entire cluster. Once Amazon allocates you the resources, you can deploy a cluster in about 40 seconds. It will download everything from an integration branch, compile it all, everything, cluster the whole thing. And even with that, we're still burning thousands of dollars to run these experiments. And so what was the first thing that we learned? Well, we learned we wanted to get rid of distributed Erlang. Uh, it was too hard to debug. We weren't taking advantage of it. And so we decided we wanted to take a step back and rewrite membership from the ground up, TCP, all custom code, all in Erlang. Um, we initially built it with EPMD to get the abstractions correct. We were then going to adapt all of our code to use the new membership service. This membership service would be configurable at runtime. And then, once we don't have EPMD anymore, we need a way for nodes to know about each other. And so we had to write a custom service discovery system, which we did. So I'm going to talk about uh, the first and the third, because the second one is just kind of grunt work that we did. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to present uh, a new library that we've been working on. Uh, this is open, all of this is open source. We're, we're funded by an EU project and a university, so you can use all of this code if you are interested. Uh, the first thing was uh, we built a library called Partisan, which is a uh, membership service library. Um, it is completely pluggable. It is runtime configuration of different topologies. Uh, it has four different implementations currently that you can operate. So at runtime, you can specify you want full membership using distributed Erlang, which is our kind of reference uh, architecture. Uh, full membership with TCP, which would ditch distributed Erlang. None of the nodes would connect to each other at all and do everything via TCP. And then two TCP-based uh, models for membership. Uh, one that forces the servers into a client-server topology, so a hub-and-spoke model where you can have an arbitrary number of servers and clients, and then a peer-to-peer, -peer, highly scalable model built on the HyperV protocol, which is slowly becoming our own. In addition to this, uh, the code isn't completely separated in the repos yet, but we also built a visualization tool that allows you to visualize the entire cluster and visually inspect the topology to ensure it's correct, which has been very nice for debugging. Uh, the full membership service obviously works the way you would expect it to. Nodes have full visibility into all members of the cluster. Uh, failure to de detection is performed by interval-based heart beating. Uh, and has limited scalability, obviously, as we discussed before, because of the way this has to work. But this served as a reference architecture for us to get the abstraction right and write a test suite that we could later use against the other implementations. 
The client server uh, model uh, has servers tag themselves as either a client or a server. They will heartbeat the nodes they are aware of. Uh, it has limited scalability because it's a server <laughs> and with a bunch of clients. Uh, and finally, uh, we only use this for a reference architecture for papers to show that our system is better than client server. Uh, and so, but it's nice to have this model because it's, it's nice to see your application work on different topologies. Finally, the one that we've been working the most on, which is the default protocol for partisan, is HyperView, partial view protocol. So the way this protocol works is that uh, you have a fixed number of members in the cluster you know about, and then you know about potentially up to log n other members of the cluster that you use as replacements for when you can't talk to the, the parties in the primary. You maintain active TCP connections to those members, and what you do is you use that for failure detection. So if the TCP connection goes down, you consider the node failed unless it contacts you again. And academically, this protocol has been scaled to 10,000 nodes uh, above um, in evaluations. But the problem is, is that the protocol is probabilistic, which means that under certain situations, you can end up with nodes that are disconnected and need to rejoin. Now, once we have all these members, once we scale up to all of these members, uh, what do we have to do to get these nodes talking to each other? And so we built a small system for integration with Mesos called Sprinter. Uh, and Sprinter's pretty straightforward. It, um, it just kind of reads information out of Mesos' metadata. So this is Mesos specific. Obviously, the name is Marathon Inspired. And uh, what it does is it just finds all of the running instances and, and gets them clustered together. And it uses Partisan's configuration to determine how to cluster the nodes properly. Now, you must imagine that if you're trying to run a, an evaluation at 1,000 nodes or something, you have to be able to debug this stuff and figure out what's going on. And so what Sprinter will do is periodically archive all of its results to S3, so all of the local membership views on all of the nodes to S3, and then an elected node will pull that down and build a graph. This is how the visualization works. And what we do with this graph is we can perform all sorts of analysis. So we can verify nice properties like if I know about a node, that node knows about me, which verifies symmetry, which increases fault tolerance and pro partition problems. We can identify nodes that have been completely isolated from the cluster by performing graph analysis. And we can trigger all sorts of alerts while the system is running. And so this is a nice property to have, but as you can imagine, it adds coordination, S3. And so uh, this is mainly used for debugging, so we know that everything is working uh, while we're trying to test this stuff, because testing this stuff is very, very difficult to do. So if we move to the next evaluation, which is uh, what's in progress now, so a lot of this is in pro like, like you know, I, there are people, I think, in Portugal working on it as I'm giving the talk. Uh, we wanted to kind of do this whole thing again, but we wanted to do it all on Amazon. We wanted to have it a push button. I have master's students that are working in my group. They don't need to know how Amazon works. They need to have one button to deploy our system and test it, and that's exactly what we want. Um, we wanted to do this all at runtime. We wanted to be able to change the application at runtime that we used. Maybe it's the ad counter. Maybe it's this other thing. Who knows? Once we ran the experiment, we wanted the ability to repeat multiple experiments in a row and aggregate their results together. And we wanted everything to be automated through GNU plot. <laughs> so everything, once it runs, auto-generates plots for everything. And we wanted this as a requirement. And finally, the other big requirement is that we need to, we need to minimize coordination. Again, like I said, you can't have a single thing run this whole test because it slows it down. You're testing that one thing. You're testing the coordination point. You're not testing the system. So how did we do the orchestration? And so along the way, we decided we came up with this thing. Uh, I don't know what the name is. The name I came up with yesterday uh, was uh, Workflow CRDT. I don't know what I call this, really. But we came up with a novel new data structure that is asynchronously propagated through the system that effectively enforces a lockstep workflow. So it will say, I will disseminate through the cluster using the normal stuff, and I will say when to move to the next phase. What are the phases we have to do? Phases we have to do um, are we need to have nodes generate their own events. So if you have a single node in the system generating the events, it will not generate them fast enough to exhaust your system to benchmark it properly. And so we needed to have every node in the system have its own workflow, uh, sorry, own workload, synthetic workload. It generated its own events. And this simulates like somebody doing a mobile phone, right? Like people are generating their own events at their own intervals. <clears throat> Once all the events were generated, we needed to wait for the cluster to converge. So we needed to wait for all the nodes to see all the events. And so we disseminate this workflow structure around, and every node, when it sees all the events, it goes, yeah, I know, that's done. I know that's done. And all the nodes need to know is a description of the workflow to determine this. 
Finally, uh, what we have to do is once we have convergence and all the nodes have made all this nice log data, uh, we have to aggregate all of that log data together. And so this is a centralized point, S3 again we use. Everything's uploaded to S3. Finally, once everything's uploaded, we have the nodes shut down so the next experiment can automatically start. And so this is nice. We run these things, we go to sleep. And uh, that's what this external monitoring system does. And so I will kind of wrap up. I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, so we'll kind of get to what we learned. Um, and so what did, what did we learn from doing all this stuff? So at least when it comes to LASP, we learned that uh, single node orchestration is very bad. You need to get rid of these nodes because they slow down your entire system. Uh, additionally, um, partial views are important. Uh, a lot of optimizations around building differentials to synchronize state better. If you need to do that causally, which is the way to get the least garbage, you have to only be talking to a subset of the members. If you want to enforce some notion of delivery guarantees, like causal delivery, maybe not total order, but causal delivery, you need to only know a subset of the members. The system gets a lot easier to run at scale when you don't have to know about everybody in the system, and you only can work with a portion of them. The challenge here, again, is the probabilistic protocol. How do you ensure that you can build a system where this is possible? And so I think the results have paid off, at least in terms of memory and CPU, because as I said at the beginning of this talk in February, our system required 2 gigs per VM to run, and we are now down to 75 meg per instance. And so when you don't have to maintain this whole membership list, you don't have to do all this heartbeating, you can track very little state, you can build a map of just your peers you talk to and incrementally send data to them, not have to worry about full state fallback. You get a very lot of nice properties when you start kind of making your system uh, kind of more layered and think about each component uh, as, as components that need to be optimized, but also thought about like holistically in the guarantees that you can provide. Um, in terms of this partisan library that I'm presenting today, um, fast churn isolates nodes. Uh, if you are joining to the cluster super fast, uh, you can run into a uh, race condition where two nodes will get, uh, one node will get disconnected from all of its peers at the same time because uh, some shuffle gets reordered or something. Um, so you have to be able to deal with this. Now this is fine for us because we're building things for mobile devices. And you're expecting mobile devices to get disconnected all the time, right? It's in your pocket, you're walking around, it's moving, all this stuff. Um, never mind subways, planes. Whatever. Uh, the second thing we learned is, man, a lot of protocols assume FIFO delivery across all connections you'll ever have between two peers, not just one. And so this is a thing that's not made clear in some of the literature. And so you have to be aware of this. Uh, because if you need to enforce this guarantee, you need to start adding acknowledgments. You need to start adding sequence numbers. You need to start adding a lot of information to make this work. Finally, when you want to build a system where you layer components together, all of the components you're layering need to have the same system model. Is this true? Absolutely not. These papers have all sorts of different system models, and you have to be very careful, because some paper that's written for a crash stop model is not necessarily compatible with a paper that's written for a fail stop model, because that model assumes that you'll never make an arid state, you can reliably detect failures and things like this. So when you're composing these systems, you may have to make a bunch of changes to make them work together. And so we have one student who has been a uh, very student of mine, uh, a student of somebody else's that's working with me, uh, um, has, has spent a month uh, on partisan, uh, just solving some problems related to these three things. So we built the whole prototype, and then to solve a few of the race conditions, it's taken one to two months for just those. And uh, so finally, why, how, how do you make this easier? Well, one thing that we learned is if you can make your membership system pluggable, you can debug the components independently. So what we can say is that, oh, this last application doesn't work? OK, I'll change it to client server. I know client server works. Now I can switch it back to peer-to-peer. -peer. Oh, now I know the problems in peer-to-peer. -peer. So if you build a layered system where you can swap out components, you can debug things very, very nice. The visualization is really great here. So what do we have today? So today, do we have 10,000 nodes? No. Do I have to the end of the year to get it? Absolutely. <laughs> that's, what they e <laughs> that's what your tax dollars are going to my EU project, <laughs> uh, which is effectively going to Amazon in, in Dublin. So, um, so yeah. Uh, so what do we have? We have reproducibility for every run out of the ones that we've done at 300 nodes. So we run 300 node clusters without a problem, which is very nice, which is our latest result. 
We have run 500 node clusters, but you run into partition problems. So sometimes the runs won't complete because some nodes will get permanently partitioned and can't get rejoined. We have the same behavior at 1,000 nodes, but we do not run into any problems with the application at those number of nodes yet. And so I think that's pretty impressive because we haven't really seen, or I haven't seen anybody do that with distal yet, at least across the internet. Um, it's harder to run larger evaluations because this stuff is expensive as hell to run on Amazon. Amazon is probably the least cost-effective cloud computing environment you could ever run into. You pay for everything, and there are limits on everything. We tried starting more than 25 nodes. I had to wait two days for Amazon to increase my limits. What are we at? We, we can get 190 nodes on Amazon now. So we can get a lot of resources. That gives us, I forget what, some like insane amount of memory and computing cores. Uh, and it's paid off because according to the evaluation now, we have a 100 100x improvement in state reduction. Uh, so we are much more efficient in disseminating state and we can do this at 300 nodes and we have evaluations to prove it, but I cannot show you those just today. But if you wait a month and contact me, you'll be able to see more. So finally, the takeaways. What are the takeaways? Visualizations are important. If you can look at how the system is running, if you know how the system is running, you'll be able to scale things. You'll know where the bottlenecks are. It's important to build these things ahead of time. Two, control changes. Make your changes, do your changes in a principled way. As part of our small little team, we do not accept a PR that changes a core functionality without graphs. You have to draw graphs. You have to draw graphs, you have to back it up, you have to say exactly why it's changed, you have to, it has to be empirical whole way through. Now you might say, how the hell do you get people to draw graphs? <laughs> well, you automate the hell out of everything. We have everything automated. The graph generation is automated. All you have to do is be online and be able to talk to S3. Everything is automatic. And we spent about two months doing this. Um, a little story about this. I had a grad student from uh, Google Summer of Code, actually an undergrad from Google Summer of Code. He worked on a project on deforestation, dynamic deforestation for the uh, paper. He wrote this whole thing. I said, let's submit a paper. The deadline's in one week. Let's work on it. He said, how am I going to get the graphs? With the infrastructure we built, in four hours he had graphs demonstrating the entire thing, and we saw there was a 30% state reduction, we submitted the paper to a conference workshop. Um, so what am I saying? Make your work testable. You're gonna run this stuff in the cloud, you need visualizations, you need stuff, you need to be able to identify where the components are, you need to have reproducibility, and you need to have graphs. And so that is my message, uh, and hopefully next time I see you next year, we'll have 10,000 notes. So thank you very much. So we have two minutes for questions. How does this approach um, merge together with how do you work with the team and so you know push the graph and how do you get the graphs to have Yep. Um, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, how does this compare to the other efforts on scaling distributed learning? Uh, so I, I feel that our effort is largely orthogonal. Um, because uh, we get to take advantage of a lot of unique properties that our language provides. Now, uh, you know, it's built for different things. I mean, I've, I've, I've been uh, following the work around the DHT approach. Uh, the DHT approach is great if you have to scale a registry where you want to target nodes by names. So if you need to support something like global, you want to target nodes by names, and you want to have, uh, like, you know, log n worst time routing, then that is the correct approach. Um, I don't believe that... I believe that while that will scale in a distributed sense, I think that the pro I'm not sold on the programming model. Because I think that when you do, if you do hit a node that's 20,000 nodes, you're not going to be able to start naming processes. You just can't do it. And so fundamentally, something has to change around the programming model. And so this you know, pub sub is one idea that's very interesting if it can be more tightly integrated with the language. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Non-Byzantine, everybody loves everybody. Yes, no, um, we, uh, we have a, there is a, uh, there is a group in uh, Nova in Lisbon uh, that, is, uh, that is working on security. We are not working on security, they are. And so uh, I can't comment on, on their work, but uh, we are looking at it. It's just not my group because I'm focused around uh, th this stuff, at least for now. So yeah, we assume everybody is one big happy family. <laughs> what? Well, I mean, for this point in the work, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, you know, Uber, Uber already has the story about that problem. But okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs>